happy about that. Um, so that is wonderful. Uh, just for everybody who's on, yes, just for making it easy. Everybody should know where their mute function is. You can mute yourself up on the top right hand corner is your little mute function. And then obviously you can always raise your hand and or put stuff in the chat. That's easy. And um, you can see who's in the meeting with the participant list on the right hand side. So we'll do that and we've got a full agenda so yeah we have a new member yay um we have tyler essenberg tyler i think i see you up on my screen i think you got to so go ahead and wave there tyler thanks for joining us um for being part of uh our citizens advisory work group um tyler you want maybe want to unmute yourself and just say uh what area of the state that you're from and what inspired you to be part of the citizens advisory work group sure thanks abby and uh first and foremost grateful to be here grateful for the work that this team has done um i was born and raised in northern michigan a small town ellsworth north of traverse city um, i've been in indianapolis the last six years um, professionally, I work in lean process improvement and um, we moved back to Grand Rapids, oh boy, three months ago and I didn't know what PFAS was and I learned very quickly what it was um, and um, so we, we live just east of Gerald R. Ford Airport. Um, we're on well water. Luckily, we did not detect for PFAS, but um, that's not the case for many of our neighbors. So. Um, I'm really grateful for the work that this team does from an awareness standpoint. I'm hoping over time more people know what PFAS is. Um, testing, you know, the price of that can come down and just people can be better informed. So really excited to be here and thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit who I am, Abby. Yeah, thank you, Tyler, for joining us. Appreciate it. And you're on the cusp of a great meeting. I think we've got a um, Sandy and Connie and the team have put together some great things. So I think the only thing I'm going to do tonight, um, besides giving you a great big welcome, happy 2022, is I'm just going to do roll call just so that we know who's on the meeting, who's not. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy and to Connie to kind of go through um, some of the uh, ideas that they've got on there. So. Yes, so let's go ahead and, and just run in. We have a pretty extensive list of members. Um, and right now we've got about 31 people on the meeting, but I don't know if we've got everybody. So let's just run through. So uh, Gail Dugan, if you can, if uh, we can just have you say here or raise your hand. Because uh, I don't think I see Gail, okay. Um, how about Pam McQueer? Is Pam here today? No. Nope. Okay. How about Laura Ogar? All right. Um, Bob Delaney. Bob, are you on? I don't see his name. Uh, Brad Venman. I do yep, see. I'm here. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Charlie Schlinger. Are you here, Charlie? Mm, I don't see him in the S's or in the C's. So maybe he will jo join on. Alia Daiga. Huh? How about Kate uh, Gilslin? Gilslin? I'm probably slaughtering that. Um, Aaron Weed. No? Oh, okay. Uh, Sandy Winstelt. We know Sandy. I'm here. Perfect. Uh, Patty Baldwin, are you on today? Uh, Tyler is here. Thank you. Uh, Ken Harvey, did Ken make it today? We have some family stuff. Kelly, do you know? He was going to try to make it, but it doesn't look like he's on. Okay, we'll see if he can come in later. Uh, Lynn McIntosh, she changed your mind and join us today. I don't see her on. 
Um, Liz uh, Hoptman. Hoptman, is that the right way to say that? Oh, and Bob Pataki, are you here today? All right, uh, Rich Burns. Let's see, Rich. Dave Wind, I'm pretty sure I saw you, Dave. Yep, I'm here. Perfect. Margaret Brum. Uh, gosh, so many people are here all the time. Daniel Burlingame. I don't know that I've seen him at all. Matt Farr. Farr. And I don't think I've seen him in a long time. Uh, Jeremy Welsh. Mary Blanchard. Here. Thanks, Mary. How about Stacy Taylor? Did Stacy come today? Nope. Uh, she actually moved out of Michigan. Stacy Taylor moved? Yeah, so she's not going to be on here anymore. No, that's not correct. Oh. Okay. It must have been a different Stacy Taylor that I got an email from then today. Oh, just today. Okay. All right. Um, we'll clear that up later then. Uh, how about uh, Christina Schroeder? I don't know, Christina. I'm pretty sure I saw Tony. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Tony. Thank uh, Jeffrey Dutton. Uh, Rick Rodisky is on. Here. Yep. Thank you. Shil uh, Shalene Thurston. I don't know if she's. I think she was hoping to try to make it. Uh, Dan Brown. Is Dan on? Yep. Dan's here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, John Kang. Joe, I'm Joe. here. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Uh, Bill Creel. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Dave Norwood. Uh, nope. Uh, Teresa Landrum. I think here. I heard you. Here. Connie. Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Uh, Justin Patak. And Bill Burnett. Is Bill on today? No? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for uh, jumping in there. Did we have any members join by phone as we were doing roll? Yes, we did. Okay. Who's, who's on? Yeah. Who's on the phone? Uh, Gail Dugan, phone number 207-4120. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Yep, you were the first one I, I tried to call, so thanks for identifying yourself. Appreciate it. Okay, um, so with that, that gives you an idea of, um, and we do hear from a lot of, even though a lot of members aren't here tonight, we do hear <coughs> from a lot of them uh, throughout the month. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sandy and to um, Connie, and then they're going to get assistance from uh, Jerry Jennings, our uh, facilitator, as needed. So um, everybody else, if you can just mute yourself just so that we don't have too much feedback and we can enjoy the conversation. So my only reminder, Connie and Sandy, you want to take it away? Yeah, I'll defer to Sandy first. Sandy? Well, all right then. Um, so we, we thought that... Um, you know, there's been email traffic back and forth throughout the holidays. And first, I just want to thank everybody who got back to us with some feedback on um, trying to figure out a way to organize this and, and set up some ideas for structure and ground rules and all of that. I know everybody was busy over the holidays, yet you all took time to do that. So I think that just shows the dedication we have to this. Um, we thought maybe a good place to start was just reviewing the COG and um, and what the charter looked like and all of that so that we could just get grounded. I wasn't thinking that we would have a lot of discussion about it or debate about it, though I think if we want to do that at a later date, I think that would be fine, but just as a way so that we could kind of uh, remind ourselves sort of what our purpose is here. Um, and then we thought we would talk about leadership structure and then also proposed ground rules um, for meetings, which I think should go pretty easy. So that's what I was planning on today. Connie, did you have anything to add? 
Uh, yeah, I, I think the thing we want to mention is the document that was sent out was based on our last COG meeting on December 14th, 2021, where we had two action items. The first one is to provide citizen-led leadership for the COG because we're trying to be uh, responsive to the rules that are or to the provisions in the charter, which allows us to have a chair, vice chair, and so on. And since 2019, we really haven't done that. So we think it's about time for us to get that done. And then secondly, the second action item that came out of that meeting was to propose ground rules. So we started off by doing a lot of research on how to run an effective POG meeting, and well, effective meeting in general. And some of our ground rules are based on Stanford University research and Harvard University. So while they look very simple, they are based on research of some preeminent universities. Uh, we, we wanted the COG members to first begin by looking, though, at the overview and the purpose sections that are in your, um, your COG charter. And so before we get to the ground rules, we, you know, well, I think I'll defer on that. Uh, let's stay where we are right now on the proposed COG meeting ground rules. Um, very simple ones. Very simple. If you're going to have a meeting, you really got to focus on leadership rather than control. So we're trying to develop and make those the meetings that we have very, uh, very productive, welcoming, effective. And one way to do that is, if it's possible, to come prepared for the meeting. Uh, that's why Kelly sends out the different documents. If you could just take like 15 minutes before a meeting and look at these documents so that you know, you're prepared for the meeting and can contribute. Uh, also show up on time. I know that's not always possible. I, I truly understand that. But if you can, that would be great. Um, I know it's difficult to always be present at a meeting. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're, uh, say, even praying, sometimes your mind just wanders off. Uh, so we're going to say try to focus and don't let your mind wander too much during the meeting so that you'll keep on track of what's going on. Uh, also, I think start on a positive note. We all want to participate in good faith. And we really want these meetings to be meetings where it's enjoyable too. You know, having your cake and ice cream instead of having something like flu and the coronavirus at the same time. We want this to be very positive. So it's the cake and ice cream. Think of that. Okay, keep an open mind. Uh, leave your baggage at the door. That's really tough because <laughs> In this day and age, everybody is very set on what they want to see, and they it's my way or the highway. And I think we've got to for this COG meeting because we are we are representing the citizens that have been impacted by a heck of a lot of communities in the state of Michigan. And we're also trying to protect the natural resources, particularly our rivers, the fish that we catch out of the rivers. Of uh, the deer that are full of PFAS, you know, at the different marshes in Oscoda, whatever. Uh, so just let's try to accomplish and really move forward to make, to have some good results on PFAS. I know we're re really listing a lot of these sites. We also got to focus not just on communicating, but I like Dave Wynn's idea on being preventive. So we can also talk about being preventive and then addressing how can, you know, try to address some of these sites. One thing I learned from that summit uh, that uh, we have, it made me feel a little bit more upbeat because even though these are in indestructible PFAS constituents, there is technology that can possibly whip them. And before that, I was thinking, this looks like a lost cause. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot more upbeat that I think with technology, we can address some of these problems. Okay, follow and stick to the agenda. That's always difficult. You know, that's always difficult. Uh, we got to try to do that. <laughs> uh, so we'll focus on the agenda items. 
And uh, I know that there has been a little bit of discussion in the past that sometimes people feel as if uh, mm, they can't really speak up. Well, we're, we're all adults, we're all beyond the fifth grade. And if you wanna speak up, you speak up because I think honesty is going to be the key on this, on our success as a COG. We have to be honest with each other and we really have to focus on facts, not on speculation, only on facts. We have to be patient and listen so that we're not, you know, don't interrupt others when they're, when they're speaking. Uh, respect if somebody has a different opinion. They might just change your mind about what you're thinking. So be open to new ideas. And most important, don't be afraid to ask any question. I don't care if it's hard or simple, ask it. You're welcome to always ask a question. I know in the past it was a little difficult for us to ask questions because we couldn't understand when that line was through the microphone. It was more of a technological issue, but as time is passing on, we're getting better at that. So just unmute it, raise your hand, and, and ask those questions. Don't be afraid. And then focus on solutions. That's the key for us. We have to come up with solutions to this. We have to let be transparent, be truthful, and focus on solutions so that everyone can feel feels heard and you feel like a part of this team. That is one of the key things I learned from my experience of being on this is the fact that when you are in one of the committees, whether it's engaging the public subcommittee so we can communicate better on PFAS issues to our affected communities, whatever committee, preventive committee, the web committee, you get close to the people that you're working with. And it's and in this time when we're so isolated and we're acting like her, living like hermits, this is really bonds us with the people that are in the committee. So for those folks that are a little on the shy side, join one of the committees, you know, they're small groups and you really get to, you get a viewpoint of what other people in the other parts of the state are thinking. And that's very productive when you can get that cross fertilization of ideas. Okay, so I think I covered them. Now the key question on this uh, proposed list of ground rules, we had sent them out, people provided feedback on them, which is why you see the comments in the parentheses. Uh, so the question is, do you have any other ground rules you'd like to add to the COG uh, meetings? Is there anything else you would like to see us add? Like, would you like to see a little more humor <laughs> or something or jokes or whatever? Is there anything else you can think of that would make us more effective in communicating PFAS to our affected communities? This is Dan. I, I said this in some of those email threads, but just basically applying those ground rules to the chain as well. To the what, Dan? I think Dan said applying them to the email chains as well. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I got a I got a kid in my arm that's uh, making his voice heard as well. Okay, he took that speak up quite seriously. Good. Um, yeah, that's probably a good idea because I know sometimes we use those email chains in between meetings to kind of communicate some stuff. So maybe trying to make sure that we keep um, we keep focused on those things during email chains, I think would be good. Anything else people want to add or think we could delete or I don't want to spend like years on this, but I think it's important we set the ground rules from the start. For anyone hesitant to speak, now's, now's your time. Okay, well, I think... Uh, Mary, Mary has her hand up. Okay. Hello. Hello. I, I was wondering if uh, 
Dan or whoever could clarify like the types of things with the emails that they're concerned about. Dan, are you still there? Yeah, I, I am. So, so I, I said this in some previous emails. Um, so we can we can refer back to those. Uh, I don't want to take up a huge amount of time, but uh, basically being civil, um, you know, I think and I, I said this during the last meeting, but basically just the the assumption that we're all here in good faith to try and help communities and form communities, um, you know, try to solve PFAS problems and protect people in the environment uh, and, and basically entering the discussion either by email or on the meetings with that in mind. Um, and, and I think most of us do that, um, um, but you know, basically getting that in, in the rules um, in a way that applies to you know, all, all the ways that the, the COG is interacting, be that email or virtual meetings or, or however. Um, you know, basically that that civility I think is is key, uh, and then you know the other points that Connie was talking about in the ground rules of just you know staying on topic, staying focused. Um, you know that all of us could go on about you know really specific issues or um, you know other other topics, be it lead or you know anything else that we see in the news, and all of that is important. But you know really trying to keep the cog focused on PFAS and the issues at hand, I think is is essential. Did that, did that help, Mary? That's fine. I, I just wasn't sure exactly. I knew that I had seen the email where he talked about the civility and stuff. I just wasn't sure if there were other ground rules they wanted to use as far as the emails. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've all learned the challenge with the emails. You can't really read people's humor or read people's emotions. So you almost have to be extra sensitive on emails sometimes. All right. Anything else with the ground rules we should cover or can we move on, you think? I'm hearing nothing, so I'm going to assume we can either everyone's asleep or we can move on. So um, thank you, Connie. You're welcome. Um, the other thing we did was we sent out the COG um, charter, and I think everybody got a chance to look at that. Jerry, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add about discussion around the COG charter or? or... I just think that um, we could take it page by page if we wanted to, just to see, do people have questions or um, things they would like to highlight on the first page? And we may find that nobody does, and. We may be through this in 10 or 15 minutes that way, so that may be one way to do it. Well, I would like to focus on the scope and the leadership because that's going to uh, be a segue into looking at how we actually implement the procedure of electing leaders for the COG. So, uh, I think those are the most important parts. And it there's there's some really key sentences in the action in the document, the leadership document. And that is that the COG serves as a voice for impacted communities in providing advice to MPART and fulfilling, quote, its mandate to address PFAS threats with transparency and accountability. We're the bridge between the citizens living in those communities and MPART. And to gain the trust, that's why we have to be truthful and transparent and timely in our communications with each other and with the PFAS affected communities. So if you read um, the COG leadership section, it will say the work group, will consist of residents from impacted communities. MPART will appoint two members from an impacted community, and the members may elect a chairperson and a vice chair for terms not to exceed two years to help the work group and coordinate with MPART. 
So our purpose is to assist and help Empire, but I see us more working as a team together. You know, very much a team. We're we're there to help Empire, and but again, we got to follow the ground rules in doing that. Okay, Gary, I said my part on the the purpose. So, does anyone have any other questions about? The work group charter. Looks I have like to, Bill's yes. got his hand up. Who does? Bill. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I see that note in there that members are appointed for two years. Mm -hmm. and it seems like <clears throat> like a lot of us about two and a half years ago, and um, I'm not sure if we've been reappointed or if that's something that's not happening. But I. I'm just curious, this is what our charter says. And I, I don't know that we're following this part of it. Well, I read, no, the part is the members may elect a chair and vice chair for terms not to exceed two years. Yeah, but right above that, it says, <clears throat> interestingly enough, that the member appointments are for terms of two years. It also points out with no limitation for reappointment. so. Maybe the operative question is, do is there a, a way to have the reappointment happening or has it just been kind of not happening yet and needs to start happening? Correct. Yeah, that I guess that's what I'm asking is I, I I'd forgotten about this, frankly, and it's you know, I, I'm not sure I got reappointed or if any of us did, but. Or if it's a moot point, we don't want to deal with it. I think, it's I think we should look at at the for the next meeting when we really go through detail on the on the charter. Uh, I I was I, really focusing on more the scope and the purpose, but you raise a point, and that's one of the things we talked about is doing a review of the charter in an upcoming meeting, like next like next meeting in February. Bill, I think you bring up a really good point because when we look at the number of people that were here and not here, maybe there's people that have dropped out that we didn't realize. So I, I kind of see us like stray cats. We're just always still here. We just keep showing up, whether we're invited or not. But and it, so I think, Bill, you bring up a really good point. We probably need to formalize that a little more and decide are you just automatically reappointed till you stop or? Once a year, do we put in for votes? I think that's something we can maybe not decide today, but we could talk about, you know, in upcoming meetings, how to structure it so that we have good membership and stuff. Go ahead, Mary. I think the only time that might be an issue would be if you are in a community that has quite a few members that are involved in this where they might have to, you know, somebody might choose to be on the committee. If, if it's limited to just two people from each community, they might, you know, want to take a place of somebody who's already active. Um, I, I think that would be the only time that I could see that would be a problem. Otherwise, we quite frequently don't have enough people to serve in a community. Yeah, I, I think those those two points that, that you just raised, you know, the, the membership term of two years and the two people per community, per affected community, both both of those points sound pretty obsolete to me. So I, I think it it warrants a little bit of review. Uh, you know, I, I think at this point we could make the argument that virtually all, if not all, communities in Michigan are, you know, in some way affected by this, you know, some more. Um, severely than others, but um, yeah, you know, when when that was written, we had a different understanding of the scope of the problem. So I think it it makes sense to review and you know think about how we want to implement that going forward. Anything else on the charter that people saw or were concerned about? Tony posted a note. Tony, are you on, or you you want me to read it, or? No, I was just going to say I don't I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. In it. I I thought that the the reappoint appointment came up informally at least at one of the meetings when Steve Sliver was still around, and I, that and that he asked 
I, we went through the we went through a list, and I, I thought he asked if people wanted to stay on, but I may be vague on that. But it seems like it came up at one point. We have asked a couple times when Steve retired. Um, I think I sent a note out asking if everybody wanted to stay on the cog, and then more recently, just a few weeks ago. Well, you know, Kelly, I'm wondering if we just shouldn't do just a, a sort of like a, a quick um, questionnaire to everybody. Are you willing to serve for another two years? And then we have a formal record of it. That, that seems like a simple mode to me. I mean, yeah, you know, to do the standard thing of, you know, you send out three emails and if the person doesn't respond to any of the three emails, then, um, you know, they, they sort of expire by default. Um, I, that, that makes sense to me. Of course, then we will have to have a way to uh, get people interested to join. You know, say somebody drops out, we'll, you know, we'll need to have two members from each county. How, I don't know if we run a public oh. notice or what. We, we can't force people to come, but we're going to be so much fun. They're going to be begging to come here. So I, I truly agree with I'm that. I'm not worried about that in the future. So, OK. Um, <laughs> all right. So anything else with the charter that we need to? It sounds like down the road we do want to set up another time that we review it more in depth, right? And make sure we're following each and every piece of it. Is that kind of what I'm hearing people say? You know, Sandy, what I would I would suggest is that people give the feedback on just the topics that they are having problems with. You know, like Bill on that one with, hey, members after two years, are you reappointed? That's a good point. There's a couple other points where I saw a couple of contradictions in the items. So maybe we just do another feedback thing, another feedback like we did for this uh, for this meeting. OK. I, Mary, I don't know if your hand is still up or if you have yet another question. And, and I, think I thought I saw the old Creole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no, I, I, I did not have my hand up. Yeah, I, I would suggest maybe you uh, have a small group. Once we elect the officers, maybe a small group go through the charter and suggest some changes to update it to reflect where we are today. Sure. Sounds, sounds like a good plan. Yep, it does. Yeah, I support that. All right. Anybody opposed to that idea? Yay. Okay. <clears throat> what's next? Uh, what's next is to do the nominees from the floor for anyone who is interested and running for the COG chair, the first vice chair and the second vice chair. However, we should discuss how we're going to vote on that. By that, I mean, do we raise our hand? Do we just say A or nay? Or do we do a survey? Or do we do a written ballot? or what so we have to we have to discuss among all of us here how we're going to do the voting so rick what's your thought yeah i'd like to suggest that we have um some kind of a maybe a poll or a, a written ballot because um i don't think we have a quorum today i, I don't think we do either that was one of the things i was going to ask kelly if we had a quorum and i don't think we do yeah so, uh, and I think a lot of organizations nowadays do a, uh, you know, kind of a, a write-in or, you know, a, a written ballot or uh, a poll. So I think that's, you know, probably a good way to do it. Well, I could devise a, a ballot for the group uh, once we have a list of nominees. 
And then maybe they could just email the ballot back, filled in. Sounds good. Other ideas on it? I, I mean, I, I agree with Rick's basic process. I, I think we'd also need to give people time for the nominees, is my sense, um, for, for the same reasons. And Kelly, it looks like we have like 16 people on, so we're not even close to having, right? We have like 39 members or something. Is that right? Oh, she's going to make me count. 38, mm -hmm. yeah. 37. Okay. Top row is a header. Okay. Uh, Mary, did you have a comment? Yep. I, I was just wondering that when we're doing this uh, ballot sending out, if maybe as part of that, if we could do a, just a simple survey as to how involved each member wants to be, whether they only want to get information regarding their own specific group, whether they want to, you know, be part of subcommittees, whether they want to only be involved and, in, you know, just that, you know, just a real simple type thing, because if you have people who never show up, you know, can we count them as actual people involved in the quorum? So you're thinking with the ballot or separate, if we're doing the re-up email, part of that could be, and what's your involvement, what are you thinking your involvement would be? Is that what you mean? I'm just yes. trying to sure. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, that, there is this sort of Oh. chicken egg problem where you know if we don't have a, a quorum you know in the next several meetings um yeah you know, we need some sort of alternative process for getting to that level right bill you had your hand up yeah i'd like to follow along on that quorum um, i'm a little concerned about this issue of a quorum because i don't think we have a good handle on our membership number of uh, real active members right now. And I, I think that maybe we ought to put the quorum in the back. I don't know how you establish if you have a quorum or not until you establish your you have a clear membership role. So if we want to move ahead expeditiously, I'd say we just go ahead with the people that show up and have the vote or the people that respond to email, however we're going to vote. But I'm not sure we should say we have to have a quorum because I'm not sure we know what that is. I think you're right, Bill. I agree with that. Yeah. Rick? Normally, a quorum is one more than half. So if we have like 38, you know, be like 19. But and I think Bill's saying we don't know if we have 38. No, we don't. We absolutely so, don't. That's so why we I'm, don't know what half of a mystery number is. I remember algebra. That was a hard question. Well, let me make a suggestion. Um, and I'm. <laughs> I'm going to go to our uh, experience with the uh, CAG, our, our little group for, uh, for, for Wolverine. And uh, maybe we need to have a membership committee. And yeah. I, I think, um, you know, the, the membership committee could contact each, each person and find out exactly, you know, the, like <clears throat> um, Dan meant, Daniel mentioned about, you know, are, are you interested in, you know, serving on a committee? You know, what, what's your interests? That sort of thing, and then um, I think the membership committee really needs to push uh, voting for the officers. And uh, the nice thing about uh, you know if we do a poll or if we we have write-in uh, votes that are submitted by email or whatever, um, the membership committee could look at that. And you know if if we have a quorum, um, you know if if we have 19 or 20 votes, that's probably enough. Um, but the membership committee could or the, whoever in charge of the, you know, reviewing the, the ballots and whatnot could let people know or contact the people that haven't voted. Um, but uh, I, I think membership uh, is important and, you know, the, the membership committee doesn't have to do a lot of work uh, in between, but, you know, on an annual basis, uh, I think we need to go through it. And especially if there's a two year, uh, you know, window to, to find out who needs to be re-upped and if they want to be re-upped and, 
you know, it's it's an important part of a, a group, and I, I think it deserves to have a committee of some sort. Just my thoughts. I, I will say um, I agree with Rick. That's been really helpful in the CAG we have here at Wolverine, not only because it kind of makes sure that we have a vibrant group at all times, but it helps us identify when we have pockets that maybe aren't being represented and they can point that out to us and help us make sure that we've got good representation. So, Mary, I don't know if your hand's up again or if it's, if your arm's getting tired and you don't want to put it down. Sorry, I, I'm not sure. How That's I okay, I just wanted to make sure. I didn't want to. Is it oh, down Abby. now? Abby has a question. Um, I just have a quick question for Kelly. Kelly, did you hit the record button on this meeting? It looks like it's on. Yes, Is it, it did. On? Okay, good. All right, just a little panic moment there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thanks. That's all I had. Okay, Sandy, I have a suggestion. Because we can't keep deferring and we, you know, <clears throat> We've got to get things moving. I, I've said that a number of times already. What I think we should do, and I'll let me throw this out to the whole group, is we establish today a temporary leadership team. Temporary. When you've got your membership committee all set up and running, then we can do a formal and another election. Another vote for who should be chair first and second. We can't keep kicking the can down the road. It's gone on for too long. So how about having a temporary three people on a rotating basis like you suggest, but not for two years, only until the next, well, when the formal membership team can uh, get together and prepare a, a ballot after nominees are are given to them. What's your thought on that group group wise? All of you, what are your thoughts on that? For example, I'll throw it out on the table. I would nominate Sandy as the cog chair. That would be one. Somebody else will say, I nominate so-and-so as first vice chair and so-and-so for second vice chair. You've got your group today, but they're only temporary until we get the formal leadership team in. What do people think? About Maybe that? people should offer to uh, take a position if they want one. that too. Wait, say that again, Mary. I didn't get it. Instead of people nominating somebody, maybe if people are interested in a the position, they oh, can just sure. say Absolutely. Absolutely, Mary. That's a better idea. Rick, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm I'm a little I'm leery about uh, you know, I, I think you could we could probably have a, you know, a temporary group for maybe two months, uh, but no longer than that. I, I just think that having a, uh, a leadership structure that people have not voted on and we're not given the chance to vote. And I, I don't think we've given notice that we're going to do a vote this. I mean, we, we talked about discussing it, but uh, it just leaves things open for for people to say, "I was, I don't agree with what you're doing. I wasn't part of the decision, and you know, I don't like, I, I don't like the group." So, I mean, I, I think the group. Uh, well, I'm just saying that I, I, I don't think we should, uh, you know, temporary being two months, but uh, we really need to have a vote of the group you know, by by polling or trying to get a quorum involved, because if we have a structure that's not voted on by a majority, um, the minority, well, the minority can always say something, but uh, I, I think we should have a, uh, a leadership team that's elected by a majority of uh, COG members. 
I agree, Rick. I think that's a good point. Then do we want to just hold off on the temporary idea and just wait till that membership team is, I mean, that's going to take some time. I mean, these all these people have to be contacted, all 38 or 37 people. Are you on or not? Kelly, you have your hand up. So I was wondering if you guys could humor me. Um, and I have a poll ready, and I think everybody will be able to access it, where you can just quickly vote on if you agree there should be a chair or not. Um, since we're trying to figure out a way for people to vote, this will just be quick and easy. Wait, wait, what is the point of doing that, Kelly? Uh, first of all, to test out a strategy for voting to see if it will work. And second of all, just to see how members are feeling if they want to do temporary um, chair right now or not. Let's first decide if we want to do temporary chair or not. Well, that's what that's what the question that's is. Are you oh, look at there. How nice is that? Are you in agreement of a temporary chair? Oh, I get it. OK, so we could use this as our test run of a voting strategy. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. Just to see for future meetings if this would yes. be a way that we could vote and get some consensus. Yes. For members I, to vote only. Abby, you are not a member, so do not vote. If we have more than 16 votes, we know. All right. And only else. one vote per person. I don't want to hear any yeah. ballot stuffing or anything like that. Um, so if you just but click I do on agree the with what Rick, I just want to go back. I personally agree with what Rick said that. You know, we've gone this long without leadership going another couple months. Is it going to kill us and to do it well? So everybody feels like they had a vote. Whether it's people putting their name in the hat, people being nominated, whatever, and we could do it by email. So everybody at least has the chance. OK, how do we do this vote, Kelly? Click on the link in your chat. So go to the chat feature. Oh, I'd like to make a comment, Sandy, a if I could. Yes, this is Jerry. Uh, I think that what we're doing is really we're taking a poll. Uh, votes generally, you know, have nominated. You, you make a motion. This is a poll and this is very valuable, but I just think we, it'd be better to think about it as a poll. Good. Because then good you can just direct it as the, you know, let's take this poll. Yeah. That's good. Hello, this is Teresa. I clicked on the link. It came up blank. And so I came out and went back in and won't let me click in. Hey, this is Bill. I can't get the link to open. Right, you can't get it to open. Yeah, I can't either. Can you right mouse on the click on the link? Right mouse click on the link and click open. It's in the meeting chat, right? Yeah, this this happened last time. If you remember, right, not the one that's on the screen now. When you put it on that screen, don't try to lick, click on the screen that Kelly's sharing. You have to open the chat at the top of your screen. It came up when I right clicked. I was able to put my response in. When you right click, and then uh, it, it worked for me when I did the right click. Okay. Okay, uh, Kelly, go through it again and tell us exactly where the chat is and how to click it. So just okay, so so you're seeing my screen, so don't try to click on. <laughs> um, but you'll go to the chat function right here at the top. Okay, where is it exactly at the top? In between the little people and the little smiley hand. <laughs> See, it's not opening up. Not on the, yeah, go to the very top of your screen. I am at the top. Oh, and then it should be on the right side. It might help to be in full screen mode too. I, I don't know, I had to do that uh, to get mine. Oh, yeah. We're all learning. 
it, uh, this is Brad. Mine is at the bottom, so I'm assuming it oh. doesn't have to be at the top. <laughs> right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, it can depend. It can depend on the version of Teams that you have, and if you're opening it in a browser or the app too. So, I think the old version was on the bottom in the middle, if I recall correctly. Hmm. Well, Kelly, I can't get mine to open up. So, so I have a Mac, and I can't get mine to open at all. Okay, so we've learned that we're not able to do polls quickly in this version. <laughs> every every exercise is an opportunity to learn. Right, <laughs> and it may be another one we'll have to to try another software or, you know, really clear directions or something. But this How should. How about work. if we uh, just say in the chat whether we agree or don't agree? Just type it in. If you have not voted using this function, then yes. How about you add to yeah, the chat? That's, that's a good approach. That works. So it looks like there's agreement. Yay! <laughs> we have 10. Do we have more? We had more participants though, right? We, we have 13 in the, well, three in the chat. So that equals 13, 14. So we have a few abstentions, either voluntary or otherwise. But oh, I can't, I can't. Uh... Get in there somehow. I cannot open it. Hey. You can't open the chat. Right. So we have consensus based on the members that are on the call. OK. So we are in agreement, it sounds like, for a temporary chair. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what I'm seeing. And since it's a temporary chair, maybe maybe we should just do the chair, or do you think we should also do a first and second? I just throw that out since it's temporary. What's Anybody have any this? thoughts? Well, I guess uh, isn't it uh, up to the, the how much the one person is willing to do in a temporary basis. If we need a lot of work to be done, then maybe we need more than one person. True. Mm -hmm. All right, so who's willing to step up for first vice president and second? Um, I'm sorry. First vice chair and second vice chair if Sandy wants to be chair and we don't know that yet. Right. Well, well, let's hear from Sandy. How? Oh, oh, what's your uh, interest and the commitment? I will do whatever we need to do to uh, move the CAG forward. I can help. I can stand back. It, it does not matter to me. So I will do whatever we need to do, and I'd love it if other people want to. So. Well, would you have the time and commitment you can make? I'm pretty good at carving out time. Sleep is way underrated, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, how much sleep does one person need? Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Who? But I want to hear from other people because we have a lot of really good brains on this crew. So, Tony, Tony speak up, yeah, Tony. I, I just, I, I just thank you. I just want to say that I think that Sandy would be a marvelous temporary. Now she's mad at me. I guess that, that, <laughs> that Sandy would be a marvelous temporary and permanent chairperson. I think that she has tremendous people skills. 
Uh, she's very fair-minded, uh, very thoughtful. Uh, and I really think that in terms of direction going forward, she's, uh, again, not to rule other people out, but I just think she is really an ideal person to, to, to take the leadership helm of this group and to help us to, um, you know, to, to move forward in a constructive way. Uh, thank you, Joan. Who else wants to play? Come on. Anyone else? Okay, we got 17 other people on this call. But so I, I guess you know the, the question you know, about yeah you know, the, the timing and what's expected. So we're you know looking at the next two months and you know basically it yeah it sounds like it's three people getting together to go over the documents, set the agenda for the next couple of months, carve out you know what we need to do on uh, you know leadership and membership are, are the two key things. Um, you know, to, to me, that sounds like a, a few few meetings worth of time and you know emails in between, perhaps. Uh, so I guess I just want to clarify sort of what the expectation is for for folks. Connie, would you like to um, would you like to would you be willing to join me? Since um, you know, I will be um, I would be honored to Sandy. I would be it's honored. not like homecoming court, but it, it feels close to that. So, <laughs> um, so just to give everybody else some perspective, um, you know, for us to put all of this together, I would say through phone calls and teams, what we probably spent a total of an hour and a half together. All together? Yeah. yeah. Well, Connie and I met right. several times outside of that. But yeah, it's it's going to be a couple hours, um, I would assume. So how about if we do this? Would it make sense to just, for the next month, can we get, I think what we need to do now is pull a, le a membership team together to start focusing on that so they can hit the ground running so we can start sending out and figuring out this leadership team does that sound like the next step that we probably need to do that sounds more important yes. than leadership right now I, I agree with you it's the membership team that's key now so people for that who who would be willing to be oh i thought there was a already a list for a membership team um who uh, what do we need, Rick? What do you think? Four people? I'm just guessing. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, four people is, is plenty. So, any four volunteers willing to help with the membership team? I, I'm happy to help out with this. My, my concern with, with volunteering for, for anything in particular at this point is, um, the next two months for for me are pretty pretty tight in the evenings for scheduling. Um, so I'm happy to help out, you know, especially during during daytime and and in between meetings. But you know, it's hitting the specific meeting time. So I'm I'm worried about committing to through February or March at this point. You have a wife working in a hospital and a little one, so yeah. Thank your wife for us. Yeah, and and. Uh, uh, grandma helps out a lot, um, so you know, we already ask her for quite a bit, so I don't want to burden her too much. But yeah, my my wife is an ICU doc, uh, as you can imagine, it's a little bit crazy right now. All right. Um, so yeah. All right. So Daniel's one. Who else would help out with membership? This is Mary Blanchard. I'll help. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Who else? Well, you know, since it was Rick Radisky's idea, 
to have a membership committee. He seems uh, like a logical candidate. Well, I, I'm on the uh, subcommittee, and uh, I, I've got two assignments in the subcommittee, so I, I don't know. I, I just, I'm kind of short on time for the next couple of months. And I'm also involved with uh, monitoring the pandemic, and uh, I've got a lot on my plate. Okay, Rick. We're also using them quite a bit on our CAG, so. Um, I have a technical report on the CAG due too, so. <laughs> yeah, it's like a week, so. Um, come on, anybody else? Please. Don't make me bad. <laughs> Oh, what about um, Joan or Joe, who was talking to you earlier, questioning J O H? Joe? Joe, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Would you like to help with the um, membership team? Uh, I could, yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess that's three. All right. Okay, is that so probably have, enough? We have that done. Right? Anything else we got to do with that? Well, you should arrange for time for the membership subcommittee, but we can do that by email for them to get together for, for the next job. We can do that by emails. Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess, Sandy, were you, um, I guess, were we planning to have somebody convene that or should one of us three take the lead on that? I think ideally, if one of you three could take the lead, that'd be great, but it's kind of up to you. I mean, unless you want Kelly's help or something. Well, I was going to say, Kelly already sent the form. Do you want me just to take the phone calls and then report back? Perfect. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so I'm just basically asking, right, if people want to still be members and w what their interest level of interest would be with the COG. I'm guessing so, because it sounds like we have to know how many members we have before we know if we have a quorum. OK. I mean, that, that makes sense to me, and I can I can help out, Mary, um, uh, as you need me to. That, you know, I, I think the, the thing I think we should set is basically an expectation for, you know, how many calls, how many emails, you know, what's, you know, what's just sort of the the, the final point at which we just um, you know, let let people go by by default if if we want to do that. Um, or how about, or if, if, how about if we do one phone call and one email to each person? Yeah, yeah that'll be good. Let me. Um, I need to make an update, two updates to that contact list. Um, All right. So I'll get you a new one tomorrow to work from. OK, very good, Kelly. Thank you. Abby, did you have something? Yeah, Mary, can I just propose that if after one email and one um, phone call that you don't get a response, that you just give Kelly that list and we will uh, double check with, you know, we'll do what we can to to kind of follow yeah. up, and make sure they're because sometimes people, you know, emails end up in spam and sometimes you don't always check them. And um, I have some, you know, friends and family that never did set up their voicemail boxes. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> just saying it's possible to miss a few people. So no problem. But let us um, once you make that initial contact, we can we can double check and uh, make sure because I don't want to remove people if they really had an, an inkling. But I think we kind of have an idea of who's been at these meetings and who hasn't for the last year. We can kind of give you some help with that. OK, very good. Thank you. Thanks. 
I, uh, you know, on that note, does it make sense to just follow sort of uh, your email account is about to expire and you're going to lose all your emails sort of notification, you know, where it's, you know, you've got, you, you know, if we give them a call, we send them an email, we don't hear back from them. Uh, we give that list back to MPART. Uh, you know, if MPART sends out, I think, another notification and says, you know, you have a month to respond, that, that seems very reasonable to me. Um, also. If that's good with the group, I think that's uh, that's perfectly doable for for us. Uh, one th one thought is, um, I mean, it's kind of a crazy time and people are busy. So if people are busy and don't want to be members but still want to tune in occasionally or participate, I would still want to make sure they know that door is open, that we still value their input. So if they're, you know. I don't know. They've got something going on and they just don't feel like they can be a member. I don't want them to think like they're getting kicked to the curb. Um, that I just want to encourage people to. I think every voice we get here is valuable. Absolutely. But I do think there's a level of participation we need from members. So, OK. I, that's just my thoughts. I'm open to other ideas, but. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The, the meetings are open, you know, they're, they're not exclusive, um, but there is this sort of expectation from members. So I think that's good and maybe something we should keep an eye on as we look at the charter. All right. What do we have to do next? What's next on the agenda? Well, we will have to kind of figure out the voting procedure. Um, how we're going to do that, and I think we'll just postpone that one. Uh, I liked uh, Kelly's approach uh, <clears throat> by doing it like a survey monkey kind of thing, uh, but we'll have to work out the little kinks in it. Uh, the other thing I think that the leadership uh, group or the leadership team will need to focus on and all of the COG members is in the event that there is uh, something we need to vote upon. Uh, it might be the timing or I, I don't know exactly what it'd be in the future, but if there is something we need to vote on, just how are we going to agree on how we're going to vote? Do we do it as a simple majority for uh, simple issues? But if it's a really major issue, should we have something like two thirds majority? Or that may never crop up at all at a pod meeting. I'm just we're just trying to prepare for everything that could happen. But generally, when you have meetings, you have to have some kind of rule of order and some way to make a decision as to what your next step is going to be. So if you want to make a next step, you want to kind of get people to agree with it. You would like to have the majority of it. Do you want a simple majority or do you want a two thirds majority? It's got to be simple, though, with with the decision making. So those are some things I think uh, we're going to need to consider. It may never crop up, but in case it does, we'll have a way of resolving it and getting where most people agree on something. I don't know if we want to do that right now, though, Sandy, but that is that is something that we do have to address sometime or another. <laughs> people have feelings one way or the other about that. Pardon me? Anybody have feelings one way or the other about that or what's worked well in other meetings they're in or? Well, one comment I may offer is in this business of giving advice, and we're not <laughs> in the executive uh, function here. No, we're not. <laughs> so giving the advice, that's our business. Uh, well, simple majority would be pretty good, I think, but I'm open to any other ideas. Jerry, do you have any ideas on this? Well, I do because um, actually the more we dig into the charter, I think it'll become clear that 
you know, the, the workshop or the work groups, you know, expected to try to give guidance or advice or feedback and really for the work group to speak, there has to be some sort of formal, formal way of coming to their message. And that likely will be through some kind of, of taking a tally or a vote to be able to say this is what the uh, the citizens recommend, the cog recommends. The other thing too is there may be things that in here where you can see that, that it also is possible that you might initiate, the cog might initiate uh, a recommendation knowing that it's just a recommendation it doesn't have the, the authority to be implemented totally but it certainly has weight because it comes from the citizens so at some point formal decisions probably will need to be made uh, and we wouldn't you know the cog would want to have that be something where an individual isn't speaking for the cog but instead the cog has come to an agreement and passes it on if we think out into the future, that may be the real um, contribution the COG can make to the state, if not beyond, by just having citizens' voices raised and put into put into the motion of having to be taken seriously because the governor wanted citizens to come together and, and advise, uh, recommend, suggest, and so, I think at some point, a format, like Connie's saying, a format for, for making decisions will want to be established and then used in the months beyond that. Whether that's tonight or not is not as necessary as, as seeing it as a reality. I agree. Mm -hmm. So, anybody else have ideas or thoughts? Daniel says, I agree with Jerry. I don't have strong feelings on a one vote threshold. So, I would propose that this is something that we have to um, decide down the road how we're going to make decisions. But it sounds like maybe we don't have to decide that tonight. Is that? Well, that I think as we review the the charter, I think we're going to see opportunities to to practice to practice and to make a difference. So I mean, there there are a lot of doors that are open in this document, but they're really only open to the entire membership, not like one person saying, "Okay, this is what we should do." But it, what I keep thinking about is what Abby raised and what Tony raised in his congressional um, testimony is that you know, we are we are a model for Michigan, but we could also become a model for other states uh, or at least other entities or um, things that are looking at this issue or other issues that are are similar. So I think I think Jerry's points are really valid, and it, it's I, I think it is a good idea for us to think about how our model, you know, how can we set a good example? I, I think is really what's what's important here. Um, I think there there will be important recommendations that come out at, at various times, uh, and I think having that you know that formalized format, um, you know, that procedure so that um, you know we can we can release those, you know. We can talk about that publicly and say, "Here's what the cog recommended." Yeah, I think that that, I think that's important and powerful. And like Jerry said, I think that's one of the, you know, the big contributions of how we can can make the cog a model and uh, and share these ideas out there. But it's, I think the, I think us setting the example is almost as important as, you know, what the the specifics are, uh, you know, around how we do it. Okay, Sandy, then uh, I think we would go to the next one on uh, COG concerns and maybe that feedback uh, page, which I forgot to.
print off that you had. Cog concerns. Um, oh, that's good, Kelly. That's good. Sandy, you're muted. <laughs> there, that works better. Um, so it looks like we've gone through the leadership structure and talked about those concerns. There was some question about um, before we do the full uh, vote on leadership and vice leadership, uh, do people need, would it be helpful for people to submit some kind of bio um, and disclosure? Is there an issue of conflict of interest for people? So that came up from a couple of people, which I thought was something I hadn't considered and good to discuss. So would that be helpful for people as once membership gets a grip on what we have for members and people get nominated or not or offer to be in leadership positions, would it be helpful for people to fill out a short couple sentence bio about their experience or potential conflict of interest? And I don't know what we would consider a conflict of interest because we're all members here, so. You know, Kelly, when it comes to, um, I relayed this um, idea to Kelly earlier today, is that we're, we're unpaid volunteers who are really committed to solving PFAS issues. But at the same time, I'm not sure we want our bios open to the public to read about us. Now, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I, if I'm a government employee, okay, you pay me, you're entitled to know everything about me. But if I'm a volunteer trying really hard to solve this problem, I may not want to uh, get backlash from <clears throat> a corporation that is responsible for the PFAS. And I may not want them to know my name and my address. <laughs> So I, I'm a little bit, I'm ambivalent about having bios in, in this kind of thing. Because I don't want the, I don't want the whole entire public to know about one, about me. So I don't know if anybody else shares that opinion. I think it all had to do way back in my life suffering with identity theft. <laughs> I couldn't handle, it took years to get that straightened out. So I, I'm not really sure that that is such a good idea. I could see talking about it orally, you know, that I think orally it, it may not be a problem with all the COG members, but we're to kind of like go out, well, this is recorded, so I guess it would go out to everybody. I don't know, let's hear what other people say. I'm just telling you what I think. Pam? I think you make a good point. Um, I'm sorry, everybody, that I had to join you late, but I was over on an EPA CAG meeting, so I got here as quick as what I could, and I apologize that I'm, I'm behind. But I think that it's really important, um, you know, as you just stressed, is that, you know, we be careful as to how much information the public really has internally a whole different issue i know that for me um sandy we talked about this you know representing the united states pageant this year um it i have to be forthcoming you know if i'm on here at any position or any level then we have to we have to talk about where we are and, and what we're doing we're pretty much out there, pretty open book, but I could see that some people may may not want that information out there. What do other people think? Yeah, so you know, Connie raised you know another another side of this issue I hadn't really considered, and that got me thinking about even you know other issues or, and I. I so, so I agree that you know that there there are certainly some sensitivities about sharing information. So I, I agree with Kadi on on everything she said. You know, my my whole bio is on the web for our 
you know, some, some all my stuff is out there on the web. I hadn't even really thought of that, but those, those are fair points that, that Connie made. Um, what it, as Connie was talking, what I also started thinking about, which for any number of reasons and any number of, um, issues have, have brought up over the last two years is not thinking just about, um, what, you know, is the best service and, and what is, you know, that contextual confidentiality, like we were talking last time, how to how to serve both of those things, but also, you know, how could uh, people that are not acting in good faith, um, you know, e exploit this in the future? That's not I'm not making that statement about anybody that's here now, but just thinking about you know long term, and again, thinking of it as a model. Um, you know, how would how would we all feel if, for example? Um, you know, think about those conflicts of interest. If you know, if, if uh, 3M or another polluter got a spouse or somebody that, um, you know, tried tried to to get on the cog and then you know tried to get on leadership without telling anybody that they had that connection. Um, you know that. You know, if they're a citizen of Michigan and they're on the cog, um, you know, what what do we say? But I, I would certainly be troubled by that connection personally. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer for that, but I just you know think I've raised that issue of that there's a lot of times where groups have not thought how people might exploit something, and that that was just coming to mind as as Connie was talking about you know identity theft and um, you know the risks with that. Well, I would say that would come under conflicts of interest where they would have to say, I mean, the, you'd have to say conflicts of interest. You would have to disclose them. That person should rightfully disclose that she's the spouse of a worker of 3M. That's where so, her income is coming from. Pam? Is your hand still up or did you put it up again? No, I, I put it up again. Yeah. Um, I think that when it comes to someone, you know, such as like Connie, um, and I'm sorry, I forget the other gentleman's name. I'm sorry, I have my glasses on, so I can't see. Um, but I would, I would certainly think the ramifications for somebody doing something like that, you know, being a spouse, it would jeopardize a case. But nonetheless, I will say this, and we run into this sometimes, is that, you know, you never know in the public who you're dealing with. And if you have some people in their bios up there and the information is up there, I guess it's no different. Somebody goes and Googles your name, right? They find out where you live and all of that. But what about if they, if we just do something internally where there's information that has to be filled out that's only accessible to the committee and then um, something is signed where that's not divulged, you know, to anybody <laughs> else. But at least you have a background, right? so that you know that there's nothing that will come against the um the cog and embarrassment right you don't i mean how do we know what people's background is right rick you have your hand up yeah um there's some uh language in the charter about um you know, who should and should not be on the committee and i think that's you know a, a good basis for determining conflict of interest. Um, but I, I do think that we need to be pretty specific um, about what we consider a conflict of interest. And, you know, if, if we want to say that the spot, having a spouse involved with an industrial company or something, I mean, we need to spell things out. Um, and, you know, just for example, like at, at Grand Valley, um, when I put in a research grant, um, I have a, you know, a three page conflict of interest form that lists specifically what is considered a conflict of interest. And um, I think if we go beyond what's in the charter, um, I think we need to specify what is a conflict of interest or what we would define as a conflict of interest, just because um, that's vague and um, yeah, it, it's just hard to Define, it's it's hard to cover everything unless we start specifying what specifically we think is a conflict of interest beyond what's in the charter. So um, I just don't want to have it vague because conflict of interests 
um, to, to one person is different than another. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's it, a good point. It gets fuzzy pretty quick. You know, I use 3M because they're sort of the notorious example right now, but it, you know, what if it's GM or an airport or, you know, you can quickly get into shades of gray there that, uh, um, you know, are harder to, harder to determine. And, and I think we're doing important work, but, you know, we don't have the nuclear codes here. I mean, I, I, I think we also have to kind of keep our, you know, keep in, we have to frame what we are doing here and see, you know, how much nefarious work could be done. So I'm glad it was in the charter. Thank you for noticing that, Rick. I didn't pick that up, but I guess that would be something maybe that the membership team can at least look at and review and, and give some guidance on as we move forward, right? Okay, so that was one question. Um, anything else on on bios or conflict of interest? Doesn't sound like we really had a consensus on what to do about that. But maybe it's because it's 7.30 and we're tired. No, I think it's because um, if we say anything in, like any association with a potentially responsible party, which would include a lot of industry in the state of Michigan, uh, you're going to cover a lot of people. <laughs> right. Yeah, we're going to have a pretty small. Abby, did you have a question? You had your hand up? I just, I guess I just have a suggestion. It would just be nice given that we've been virtually meeting for, well, really since the beginning of this committee, um, that if we don't do like a bio, maybe, um, maybe people could spend, you know, two minutes just telling everybody about themselves and why they would, why they're, you know, um, applying for leadership. I think if nothing else, it would be nice to hear them speak to each other, uh, speak to you guys about their motivations and what's driving them. You know, you may have a family member that works for whoever, but if you're here for a reason, you're not giving up two hours of once a month on a Tuesday night because you're looking like, um, like Sandy said, for the nuclear codes, you're just here because you're doing the right thing and you're, you're working for the common good. So I would just offer that as a suggestion. I like the oral approach that Abby suggested a lot better than a written approach. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, okay, I want to be mindful of time. It's 7.30, so we have a couple things we could do. We could keep going through um, some of the feedback that we got, or we could quickly do an update from some of the committees that have met. Um, and then kind of talk about tentative plans for upcoming agendas. I, I'm open to either one. What do people want to do? Because it is getting later. I think we go right to the subcommittee reports, defer the FOIA to next month. That topic will be deferred to next month and do the subcommittee reports and then the update on PFAS sites and community feedback. That's what I'd recommend. Is everybody okay with that? Daniel's got his thumb up. Dave Wynn's got his thumb up. All right. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so committees, I guess. We're starting at the beginning. Go ahead, Abby, if you want to take it from here or whoever. No, oh. it's up to Rick Redisky. There you go, Rick. Yeah. Yeah, I can uh, talk about engaging the public. We uh, had a brief meeting uh, prior to this one, and we've got uh, two uh, projects uh, or two assignments. One is to uh, respond to the uh, MMA letter, and we're going to, uh, Connie and I are going to work on a response to that uh, letter and uh, bring it to the uh, are engaging the public committee uh, a week before our meeting, and then hopefully we'll have something to share with the uh, COG, how we want to respond. I, th I think it's important that we do. 
they responded to our work product and um, we're going to do that uh, in kind. So uh, that's one thing that the committee is working on. The other one, um, we're going to start a, a dialogue with the uh, site manager for the Wexford Tech Center and that's been raised as a potential communication issue. So we want to kind of work through the charter and, and start our dialogue with the um, uh, the site manager and the, the local health department, find out what communications have been sent out and um, maybe have a, a brief report on that, uh, hopefully by the next meeting too. Uh, so those are the two things that we're working on. That sounds great. Wow, okay. thanks. Um, I know we have, I'm going to throw this out here. I'm probably going to kick myself later, but I know we had thrown out the recommendation for um, uh, public notification. And I just wondered if Abby, if it's possible to get some feedback on that at the next meeting as well. Yeah. Did you guys talk about that, Rick? Yeah, and, and that's, that's, yeah, I should have uh, addressed that too, but um, we did talk about that and that's exactly what we decided. We wanted to have uh, MPARTS feedback on, you know, things that uh, were not clear. I mean, our, our, our position of the, uh, the group was that this was more aspirational than a detailed roadmap and we do agree that uh, there's issues like how do you inform the public on the Huron River watershed and you know, how do you inform, uh, what, what's the radius that you inform the public and, and, you know, who's the agent to do that? So, yeah, we, uh, you know, we want to make sure the public's informed and then we want to get, have a dialogue about, you know, what, what that actually uh, means. So uh, our, our goal was to listen to uh, MPART talk about or offer their opinions and then we could meet as a subgroup and, and provide more information to clarify and then, uh, Again, we'll we'll bring that to the uh, the whole cog to to talk about. But uh, yeah, that that's that was on our agenda too. So okay, cool, good. All right. The um, anything else for Rick then for that committee? You guys got a lot done in an hour. You should be a ship shopper or something, man. Um, no, we have a lot to do. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's always easy to say what you're going to do, but now we have to do it. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, Bill, did the web review committee meet? Bill Creel. Well, hi, um, Sandy. Uh, yeah. Well, we did, but we only had a committee of one today. So. All right. So you got everything done. Yeah. So, um, just to report that we we have no comments overall on the um, overall website for the. Uh, Eagle review of their or MPARTS review of their website. And I'm a kind of a little concerned about this subcommittee. We've dwindled. Um, this was AJ's subcommittee. And I think we're down to like um, two or three members now. And if Dan Brown is going to be on um, the membership team, I think we're probably down to one or two members. So I'm not sure if this committee is going to be much, much of a viable subcommittee going forward. Unless we re recruit a couple members. Did anybody jump on and help Bill with this? Because I do think I know that was AJ's. Uh, he, he really recognized the importance of that, and I don't want us to lose that. I will volunteer to be on the committee, so. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Yeah, Pam, you got your hand up. Are you volunteering? I do. I'm, I'm happy to help in any way I can, and I appreciate the patience that, you know, the COG has had with me during um, me trying to recover from COVID. But I want to help in any way that I can. It's my last conversation with AJ is I would do anything and everything I can. So if I'm still needed or wanted, I'm happy. I'm happy to help. Well, that's right. um, <clears throat> let me just throw it out there. Well, what um, Kelly and I talked about was maybe we could take the website on in small increments. And uh, one thought was that we have this new map that's out there with all the uh, pieces, all the data on it for surface water and groundwater at different sites. And we thought as a subcommittee, maybe we could take a look at that and offer, see if we can offer any suggestions on that. So 
I'll get with it. I really appreciate Rick and Pam stepping up and uh, we'll see if we can get some action on that. All right. Yay. All right. And then the uh, preventative measures subcommittee. Yeah, <clears throat> I've, this is day when I've scheduled a uh, I've scheduled our first meeting for uh, for 2022 this coming Thursday uh, at 6 p.m. I've sent out an agenda as well as the meeting minutes from the last meeting. And uh, we've got a lot of things to, to talk about and things we want to get through. Um, so um, I'll have more information, more feedback uh, for the at, the at the next review. Great. Perfect. All right. Uh, Abby, are you going to go over the sites? Was that the next thing on the list? I think. Um, yeah, I can go through that. We are uh, officially up to 195, but 200, the 200 site is just around the corner. We have a lot of sites queued up to come on to the website. So um, officially Spartan Chemical. Superfund site is in uh, Grand Rapids, Wyoming specifically, and Saranac Landfill. Um, uh, both of them are um, have been around for a while, so they're not new to the contamination site list, but they're newer um, for PFAS, finding PFAS. So Dave, you had a question? Yeah, Abby, the question I have is, uh, and I can go on MPART if you guys don't know the answer, but uh, what I'm looking for is the amount of landfills uh, that are on for the 200 and, uh, 195 sites in Michigan. How many of those are landfills? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I was going to go through and kind of categorize the, the ones that we have, but I would say for landfills that we look at and sample, we're batting about a 70% that end up with some level of PFAS. Not all of them are super high, um, but most landfills will have some PFAS just because of the amount of different consumer goods that we use. So, Because I think that the landfills uh, in, in Michigan that are contaminated are going to play into uh, some of the preventative measures uh, that we're looking uh, forward to. Uh, so okay. um, I'd, I'd be really interested. And again, I can go on the MPART website and get it, uh, but I'd be really interested to understand how many of those landfills there are. Yeah, Dave, it looks at like a quick glance, 67 of the current sites are landfills. Look at that. Kelly's the magician. She can come up with those numbers. The Perfect. other thing I will say, Dave, is we are meeting actually tomorrow, and maybe Amy wants to say this, meeting tomorrow uh, with some of our landfill people to talk about um, creating a layer specifically for landfills. And so um, that was the other thing we were kind of working on to see that um, if we could, if we could, you know, Give a list because not all landfills are uh, have been assessed, but we've assessed the ones that we think had the most potential for PFAS contamination and had the potential, the highest risk of potential to public health, you know, uh, for, you know, area surrounding drinking water users. Thank and you. so those were the first tier of most, all of those have been assessed. Now we're into kind of the middle tier of landfills and then um, we'll get to the bottom. So, Amy, did you still have your hand up? Yeah, I was going to say the, the same thing. Um, and uh, also, I can echo what Mike is uh, saying in his notes there. Um, coming up next Thursday, we have two more landfills that are going to be added as PFAS sites. One is the Delta County landfill in Escanaba, and the other one is the De Young landfill in uh, Zealand, which is in Allegan County. Uh, and beyond that, we have another one teed up for the Riverside Sand and Gravel Landfill in Kent County. So that'll be, um, and there's actually two more on our list that are, are you know, ready to go through the MPART process. Um, and as to the layer thing, our conversation tomorrow is going to start by talking to the um, uh, materials, ma uh, materials Management Division staff who have the list of the open and active landfills. So there's hazardous waste list and there's a solid waste list. That would be pretty easy for us to, to add as layers and, and get the data together for the ones that we've sampled. 
the more difficult and larger list is the closed landfills because there's so many of them and little dumps and stuff like that. Um, but there is interest in in revisiting an old um, list of those and trying to get wrap arms around those. So that will take a little bit longer, but we are going to continue moving forward and adding more layers to our, our GIS system out there. Great. Thanks. Did that help, Dave? No, it does. Thank you. Yeah, good. All right. Abby, I have a quick question for you. Start and Chemical Superfund site. So that's an EPA led site. Uh, that yes, it's an EPA funded site. It's state lead uh, with EPA assistance. Yes. All right. And then just another question. We you're talking about different layers, which I think is really good. Uh, do you have a layer, and this may be premature, but a layer that shows the PFAS sites that have already been remediated? Uh, well, we have all these sites have been identified. Remediation will be a long term goal. So it depends on what you mean by remediated. Some sites get closed with deed restrictions and other engineering controls or institutional controls, we call them, to restrict groundwater use. Sometimes they get closed in that fashion. Um, but to actually go through a full remediation where you actually remediate everything back down to um, acceptable levels, um, you know, per our Part 201 criteria, uh, takes a very, very long time. So we don't have any sites like that right now. I just wondered if, if there was anything that was really remediated yet, but not really. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, Sandy's backyard. You're talking about 25 square miles. So yeah, it's, it's never going to be remediated. We're going to try to put in engineering controls in some uh, barriers so the stuff doesn't continue to leach into the rivers um, but to actually remediate this would be an engineering feat to say the least mm -hmm. okay the, the, the closest example i can think of on that is actually on the huron uh, with the tribar site that installed filtration mechanisms so they dramatically reduced their pfos and pfoa effluent from you know their their process um but that's you know that's a surface water site that's that's mm -hmm. very different and they still had groundwater contamination and non-point source contamination there as well so it's yeah once it's out there it's out there so it's it's a really long-term yeah. problem to clean up but that's a really good that's a really good point danielle because um what we you know what we have are having the greatest success with is obviously identifying those sites, but also then um, stopping the sources. So if you've got the active industries that are still um, discharging and they don't realize that they're discharging PFAS, we've been really, really successful at eliminating PFAS sources into our streams and rivers um, through NPDES or through other non-point source uh, pollution sources. So. In those kinds of, but in my mind, that's not remediation. That's a different category of source elimination or source reduction, source mitigation. But remediation to me means you're actually actively cleaning up the groundwater or cleaning up the soils. And that's that's where I think there's a lot of PFAS um, uh, remedial technologies being developed the treatment technologies are going crazy as you saw at our pfas summit so i'm really excited about what the future holds but we're not quite there yet dave you got a question oops dave yes. i think your yeah. hand's still up but oh, I, that's I'm okay right. it's late we're all doing that <laughs> no i'm good Okay. Um, okay, so we'll have a party at the 200th site. Not really, but that'll be coming well, up. That'll be February. We'll have a 200 party in February. Um, it's not a great uh, thing, but I will say that, you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years to identify PFAS sources puts Michigan way ahead of our, 
our counterparts um, around the country. Uh, everything, you know, most everything that was in the EPA roadmap is our uh, initiatives that Michigan's already undertaken um, to identify PFAS sources. So I think, and, you know, we're, we're really starting to get down into our priority list. We've still got some initiatives that need to go on, but I'm encouraged by, you know, the work that we're doing is really important. And I think um, to see you guys come together today is just, is fantastic. So I'm very excited. Kelly, what's the next slide? Do we have anything? Did I need to present anything after this slide? Okay. The only other thing I'll just add is um, uh, Andy Dreheim from uh, Director Clark's office um, sends his regrets today. He intended to come tonight, but he had a, a death in the family this morning. So um, uh, he will be back for next month just so you know. Okay. Anything else that we haven't covered tonight that people want to bring up or are there any ideas for future meetings that we want to make sure we get on a page so that we don't lose track of things that are important coming up? Mary has her hand up, Sandy. Oh, okay. Mary, what you got? I would just like to thank you and Connie for all the work you have put in as far as uh, all this preparation for this meeting. Thank you. Aww. You are welcome. Thank you everybody for all the work you've done. Any other uh, things? I think what I'd like to do um, afterwards is send out kind of a follow up email on topics that we'll talk about next month. It looks like it's going to be another pretty packed agenda. So, um, so stay tuned for that fun and excitement. Anything uh, else? Sandy, I, yeah, Sandy, I have a question. This is for, for Abby. Uh, I was wondering if we could ever have a follow-up uh, to that uh, marsh in Oscoda. Remember we had uh, the biologist was going to come and give us what the final results were. They were doing all kinds of research. It was at one of our, our meetings in the past, maybe about six months ago. He didn't have anything definitive, but he said in about six months he would. Um, we are expecting some results to come from a Purdue study for Clark's Marsh. Uh, I would expect yeah. that... Um, I don't know that it'll be ready for February, but we could probably get something on the agenda for March or April for sure, because I, I am expecting that to come through. Um, I'm pretty sure it's due. Yes, we'll, we'll talk to Tammy Newcomb, who's our DNR okay. uh, mm -hmm. MPART representative, and she can give us, she's following that project, so. Well hey, Abby, Tammy's here and uh, oh, March, Tammy? yeah, March would be doable. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for joining us. Oops. Oh, yeah, you he has his hand. Rick. Yeah. Yeah, along the lines of the uh, Purdue study, I, I've been talking with uh, one of the researchers involved and they also took samples of uh, the Rogue River and I know they were looking at the amphibians and, you know, PFAS accumulation and some of the uh, aquatic life in the Road River. So uh, I've been trying to get a hold of that information and they keep telling me it's not ready. So uh, I, I would be interested in an update on that too. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We can, we can do that as well. I know um, Rick part of, I think part of that data has come through, but I don't think we got the full, the rest of the water chemistry data to go with it. Okay. So we're waiting on that. I did. Yeah, see I, I think that's going to be important for the, you know, for, for our uh, uh, CAG. And uh, I would like to, you know, yeah. see the data when it's ready. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot thing to go on. Is, yeah, Oops. Abby, one final thing is, we would like to maybe hear a presentation by Medard as to PFAS concentrations in dairy milk. 
Have they researched any of that? Have they researched PFAS concentrations in meat that you get from the store in the food packaging and in the actual meat itself as a result of being in the food packaging? Uh, what I'm seeing is a lack of Medard participation. We've they've got they've got a lot of issues with biosolids concentrations on ag land. The cows taking it up, then it gets into the milk, then we drink it, and it's a circular yeah. <laughs> rotation there, of um, pots. Yeah, MDARD is active participation in all of our MPART meetings. Um, they're a small division, but they are. Uh, closely following what we've had active conversations with USDA and FDA um, about uh, food and some of those types of topics. So well, milk in particular. Yeah, and we've talked quite a bit with our colleagues in Maine and in New Mexico. Um, they both have done some dairy type sampling, um, but there hasn't been a statewide initiative yet to do that. So um, yeah, I think at this point we'll we can put that on on a list for an upcoming um, discussion. But it's not something that it's it's much harder to control because it's the general food basket versus you know an actual PFAS source that we can we can easily control. But I think it's definitely something that is a worthwhile topic. Um, you know, not only for this cog, but at a, at a national level, we should be asking those questions about food packaging and, and PFAS, what's well, going in and what's been identified. I think Maine just had some issues with eggs, I heard, with uh, PFAS and eggs. So I'm making a running list of topics that maybe we can yeah. ask for presentations over, you know, the next six months or so, so that, and, and maybe I'll send that out and if people can add to it and get some ideas of what's pertinent to their community that maybe we're not addressing. Because I want to make sure all the communities are being addressed here and that we're not leaving out some things. So, mm -hmm. um, all right, well, anything else we've I, got? I, we, yeah, oh, go maybe ahead. I, anything as ubiquitous, ubiquitous as dairy milk, you know, that hits every single family in the United States. So if we could look at where biosolids are being applied to grazing fields, we would have our sources right there. We're we're already doing that, Connie. We've got that initiative has already been done, um, but we haven't sampled milk. Okay. I mean, because it doesn't come just from Michigan. Milk. milk is, you know, I don't know where Myers gets their milk from, but there's a lot of different sources that go into um, where milk is comes from how it's originated and so we could definitely talk with them dart about that they have they have people specifically in the yeah. food and dairy division that can help us answer those kinds of questions all right i'll Great. put it on Great. the list and in the meantime avoid vegetables and milk and any and other healthy foods and <laughs> just to be eat safe i'm going to avoid broccoli all eat right. your broccoli any <laughs> Anybody else got anything? Nope. All right. We're going to get done seven minutes early then. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you, Abby and Kelly, for helping us with this. Thank you, Jerry, for Thank you, all your everybody. wisdom on this. All right. We will see you guys next month then. Adios. Okay. Sounds Adios. great. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye. bye, you guys. Oh, wait, there's a new message. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, all right. Thank you very much for all the hard work you've done tonight. Yes, thank you, Sandy.